session of thanks for remembering to do that i was uh, about to forget <laughs> the monthly briefing of the rural urban bridge initiative glad to see some familiar faces and lovely to have some new folks as well we're really thrilled we're we're doing something of a departure for us but something that is of critical importance every one of us knows for this month's session which is to really talk about how do we get messages related to uh, progressive issues progressive approaches and causes in to particularly the rural media market how do we get beyond or break through the bubble of conservative talk radio and conservative uh, voices to get a different message out. Yeah. And we have two, two fabulous speakers to lead us through that discussion today. And I'm gonna do them not justice in the introduction because they could both get five minute introductions, but we're joined um, by Lark Cobay, who founded the Public News Service more than 25 years ago, I believe, Lark can correct me if I'm off my numbers, but more than two decades ago, uh, based on her experience in the media, but also her experience about the gaps in the media. And, and Lark will give us a little bit of brief about the origin story of the public news service. And she's joined by her colleague, Josh Wise, who works with her at PNS. And Lark and Josh will do about a 20 to 25 minute uh, presentation about their work and then we'll have the balance of the time for our conversation. So as they jump in, um, please feel free to put questions in the chat box as they go along. And then of course, at the end, we can both look at the chat box, but also look for raised hands. But this is an incredibly important topic and these folks are uh, ahead of the game about just about anybody else in their success in breaking into um, small town and rural media markets. So with that introduction, Lark, if you will get us going. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? And thank you mm -hmm. so much for that introduction. I, 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 have a, I have a request favor. I would love to know who is in the room and I don't, you probably may all know each other, but I have a feeling this is a pretty wonderful group. Would you mind just putting in the chat, you know, your name, with, who you're with, uh, just, you know, anything you want to share, your favorite animal. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really important to me, especially when there's so many tough things going on in the world that, um, that we know we're, we're, we're all friends and we're there for each other. Okay, having said that, as quickly as I can, um, I grew up always with one foot in, in my feet in different places, always my whole life. It's been bridging worlds. And, um, I'll, I'll fast forward to, I got my start the old fashioned way, working in a newsroom in New York and, and moving up to what became Reuters. Um, I had a very uh, elite uh, experience of the news, very ivory tower. Um, and I left there, I went to Hollywood in Los Angeles and I saw, I lost my news innocence is the nice way to say it. Um, and that did not last long, long story short, I left the coast, I went to Idaho where my family, we have roots and I spent a lot of uh, every part of the year, every summer of my life I spent in Idaho in a cabin with an outhouse and one spigot of cold water. So um, I grew up very much in mixing these worlds. And when I went to Idaho um, to figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, I dropped down into the local media scene and I was appalled. Um, just absolutely appalled. And the voices that I thought the, that the, the, the public would benefit from hearing had uh, no leverage at all. If they were lucky, they got the last you know, sentence in the last column of a local newspaper. Forget about TV, forget about radio. They were completely outgunned and they, had, they, do, they really didn't know how badly outgunned they were. Um, uh, I volunteered for the local public radio because I came from TV and I saw that the amount of news, provided news, curated news, all ready to package news from the far right wing and for the big corporate and conglomerate interest was so sophisticated in English and Spanish at that time. 
um, that it made me realize, okay, I'm I'm leaving my I'm leaving my ivory clear, you know, pure journalist world behind, and I'm become I'm going to become an uh, uh, a journalist advocate, uh, a mission based journalist. And when I went around to think, I didn't come from the nonprofit world. I thought, who could fund this? And I thought, who who benefits? It's the nonprofits that are getting shut out. And so I went to them and I said, guys, you don't, I've done some volunteer work. You know me a little bit. Will you please fund me? Become members. You cannot control it. That's the deal. I think you're going to like it. We're going to lift these voices up so that they have equal access to the mic. And we're going to do it in the most efficient way I know how, which is a news service. So you lift up the voices, you get the stories out in a journalistic way, and you make it available to everybody. So we're not going to do a platform. We're not going to fight for eyes in that this was pre-internet days, right? We're just going to give it to everybody, and it's going to be so good that they're going to use it. And so the model worked. And then um, I didn't realize it at the time, but lightning struck. And the Ford Foundation found out about us and, and, and a brilliant funder there, Michael Lipsky, if anybody knows him, um, he said, okay, can you expand? And honestly, I had no idea. I just wanted to save the local media in Idaho. Um, but so we did. And so it's now 26 years later and we have developed a model and, and Josh can tell you more about it. But um, I think that's, that's it. I don't know how many minutes I took. Josh, over to you. <laughs> sure. Um, well, hi everyone. My name is Josh Wise. Um, I've been at Public News Service for about three years. Um, my background is doing advocacy work. Um, uh, prior to uh, being at Public News Service, I was at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Um, and then I actually went back and forth between uh, working on trade policy and working on arts work. I was an arts administrator and I've, uh, I've always had an advocacy component to the work that I've done. Um, but, um, you know, I, I come to public news service with a, a bit of a trade policy lens when it comes to rural, um, because uh, I would be out, uh, you know, going around rural Minnesota where I live and talking with communities and, you know, uh, what we would hear is, you know, NAFTA destroyed our community. Um, and um, whether it was farming communities or rural manufacturing communities. Um, and so when Donald Trump started talking about NAFTA in 2016, I, I had a, I don't know if I can say the word, a no crap moment. Of, you know, we're, we are not, our, the message of the progressive movement writ large is not the, is not the message that's resonating with large swaths of the country. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, when I came to public news service, um, I knew that public news service had this really great reach in rural areas. And, um, you know, over the last three years, we've really been working to, to beef that up, uh, both in the content side and in the uh, number of people that we've been reaching, um, you know, to make sure that we really are getting into communities where people would not be hearing the news any other way. I think that's, you know, um, the thing about public news service that that really motivates me is that the the news that we're producing would not be heard by uh folks if we weren't doing it um <clears throat> so uh, i thought i would kick us off in terms of structure here just to you know make sure we're all on the same page in terms of the media landscape which i think we probably are so this may be review um but uh you know rural media has gone away in a lot of places. I mean, you can look at the UNC map of news deserts that they update every year and it, it gets to be more every year. Um, and, you know, one thing that I think in general, I, I would say progressives, but also just journalists in general miss is what the newspaper actually was, which is that it wasn't just the source of politics or the source of, you know, holding government accountable, all of those lot of journalism goals. It was also the high school sports and the movie times and the obituaries and all of, you know, and whose birthday it is. Um, uh, you know, it was all of those things that really recreate the town square. Um, and now, of course, with the internet, every, every little bit of the town square has its own dedicated website and we're all competing for eyeballs. 
Um, and so that loss of the town square in many ways, you know, I mean, right, conservative radio goes all the way back to Father Coughlin. It's not like we're, you know, it's not like we're fighting a new phenomenon here, but I think that the demise of rural institutions writ large as reflected by the demise of the newspaper um, really speaks to the fact that there's, there's just not a shared set of facts um, among communities by and large. Um, and so people are, navigate to what's comfortable for them, which is often, you know, very partisan news. Um, you know, that, that partisan, partisan, uh, I wouldn't, maybe conservative versus liberal or open society versus closed society, however you want to talk about it, is not symmetrical, right? And so we know that, you know, for example, uh, the, uh, the attempt to combat right-wing talk, you know, right-wing very uh, strident talk radio with very left-wing strident talk radio uh, did not work, uh, right? Air America was not a successful experiment. Um, I grew up in Sacramento, California, where Rush Limbaugh was the local DJ in the 80s, and he actually had a, a counterpart on the same station who would play right after him. Uh, that guy lasted, as far as I know, just a couple of years because what, you know, got the attention of right-wing listeners did not do the same thing for people on the other side. Um, and so, you know, when we're talking about how are we, how are we getting fact-based information into into rural areas and more conservative parts of the country writ large, um, you know, it's worth pointing out that um, uh, there's not a symmetrical way to do this. It's not just about having as much funding or having, you know, as much similar content. There really are different different pathways by which um, uh, people consume and, and intake and are motivated by information, uh, which is not to say that, you know, um, that, uh, rural areas or more conservative areas should be written off. It just needs to be a different strategy. Um, and of course, you know, many of the attempts to do that have been, uh, you know, I think are, are good and they're very much experiments and we're very much an experiment and everything is iterative. Um, but the unfortunate challenge of the internet, uh, because in addition to eroding the town square, the, uh, the way that local news sites uh, and, you know, sort of niche news sites um, make their money is through engagement. Um, and that engagement means connecting with a more narrowly segmented uh, part of the population who more uh, narrowly agrees with the point of view through which the stories are being told, um, which is challenging. Um, uh, so it, it, it works, you know, sort of diametrically opposed to the recreation of the town square. So th that's the world in which, um, you know, we're kind of largely operating and on an old lark you know, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to kind of talk about the history of that and how, you know, the, the efforts of philanthropy to get into the news have kind of been fueled by coastal elites. Well, um, can I, I might pivot a little bit. So I, I will say, because I think what you're teeing me up for is, um, I have to say, I have laughed and been appalled by the arrogance of, uh, you know, my coastal friends and the media and the funders um, I, I think that no, they didn't wake up to what was happening in the rural area until 2016, honestly. Um, and, and that has been a huge, huge problem. The people that have been working out in the heartland, in the flyover uh, for decades, kind of without some of that huge money that could have, could have changed the reality that we've see, been seeing for the last couple of decades. But if you don't mind, can I share the screen, Anthony? Okay, great. Looks like I just want to drop down into some nuts and bolts to show you what it looks like. Um, let's see here. All right. So this is a look uh, at our private portal where media outlets go to download content. And this, this looks very much like a Reuters or an Associated Press. They can take any one of our three newscasts. You can see there we've got um, a collaboration with the Yonder Report, Center for Rural Strategies. We, in fact, I'm producing that with them today. Uh, the 2020 Daily Talks is a collaboration with Pacifica. We work with a lot of people. Um, these stories, they can be our own stories for any of the 27 states that we're in, or they can be um, repackaged stories from other investigative and local news outlets, primarily you know, print, um, people that want to get their message out to a wider audience, we package it, repackage it into audio and redistribute often their original print, of course, keeping all their branding and crediting. So that's 
kind of what it, that looks like. Josh, uh, do you have time to take us into a, the, like the specifics of a usage report or um, a story? Because uh, I, 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 I think sometimes it's hard to, uh, you're on mute, it's hard to envision what we're talking about, but we do lots of different media projects, products with lots of different people and we have the ability to distribute them anywhere in the US and we are also set up uh, from Mexico and Canada. And basically the, the platform, it's virtual. It could be used anywhere in the world. But what, what we have set up now, it wouldn't take us long to finish what we would need to do to distribute to Canada and Mexico too. But in the US, we're all set up. Um, Josh, can I also, yeah. and you can take it back. Sure. Um... So let me see. I had to go to my outline here, Lark, to see where we were. There. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so I just pulled up a story from Montana. Um, and um, this is what, uh, you know, a basic PNS script looks like. This is what we would send over a newswire. So if I were a you know, a news director at a local paper at a radio station or TV station, I would get, you know, I used to get this via fax. Um, uh, now, obviously, we're sending it via email. Um, although we only got rid of the fax machine, I believe in 2018. Um, but, uh, you know, the way it works is every outlet we send to has a unique code here to go into our back end and download our content. And so we'll put the audio file of the story up there. We have a print version of it as well. Um, and then we also have the, the quote files uh, as separate files so that if it's a on air talent and they want to just, you know, it used to be a rip and read, now it's a print and read or click and read, um, put it in front of the microphone and pretend like it's their own content. Uh, you know, they're welcome to do that. But we do all of these stories, time to be about two minutes long with a 30 second first cut and a 50 second second cut. And so the idea is that, you know, if I'm a a country music station in Butte, Montana, and I'm playing 54 minutes of music every hour. Uh, the public news service story is something I can put in the top or bottom of the hour newscast that I'm airing throughout the day. Um, and of course, you know, a, a lot of the stations in 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 rural are often the only thing that's, you know, their signal is the only thing that's reaching a lot of communities. And I think, you know, people who get into rural media uh, definitely don't do it for the money. They have a, you know, a lot of them do fill a very strong community service mandate. Um, and, you know, even if they are playing um, uh, music most of the time, they're still do, you know, they want to do news and they want to do current events and they want to do current affairs. They just don't have the resources. Uh, so they're relying on syndicated content. And that's what we're, you know, we're packaging our, our stories so that they're very accessible for them. Um, at the same time, we also put the contact information for our sources down here. So if it's a bigger outlet and they want to follow up on what we send, they have the um, Josh, can you go, is it, is it fast or easy for you to look at a usage report for this? Yeah, I was just going to go through the online version and then pull up the usage report. Okay, I'm thinking folks may be looking at our public site already. We've got seven yeah. minutes left. I just want to... Oh, okay. This is, yeah, this is what it's online. Um, and this is what it looks like when we send it out over the, or this is what it looks like on the, the tracking side. Um, so this particular story went out statewide in Montana. It was also in our national newscast. Um, and so you can see uh, 325 outlets around the country took the story. Uh, just over 100 were in Montana. Some of those also took the newscast. So it's a little bit of double counting. Um, but you can see the geographic distribution here. I mean, it's, it's all over Montana, mostly through Northern News Network, which redistributes our stories. Um, but you know, small outlets around the country um, who, you know, just want to be able to do a newscast. Um, and if you Google the call letters for some of these stations, you see it really runs the gamut of formats. It's say MPOC radio, Christian broadcasting, uh, community broadcasters. We get some NPR affiliates, especially those that aren't part of a big state network. Um, it's really all over the place. Um, so uh, just as a quick example to call out a couple of these stations, um, this, for example, is a map of what the stories in January in Kentucky look like. And you can see that they're mostly radio, but you can see the, you know, the outlets that are purely rural. You can see sort of where they're in, in urban areas. And if you had a, you know, if you were looking at like a, a coverage map, you would see that, you know, just then this is the beauty of radio is that the signal is so big for so many of these stations. This is WNAX in the upper Midwest. 
that even if it's, you know, the station is based in a big city, uh, their rural reach is huge in a lot of cases. Um, so I had a couple more examples pulled up here, but just for time, um, I think we'll just keep moving on through this. Um, Lark, do you want to talk about the fun to beat model, how that yeah, evolved? Um, I do. And I'm not sure if you guys are, if you want to go ahead and on our sure. site, you're on, you're on mute. Um, uh, you, if you want to go ahead and play one of the radio on our public site, or we can do it at the end. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it'll show up. So that yeah, was the problem I, we had. Hang on, Josh. I'm asking folks if they want to, they can play it. Oh. Because um, that'll be two minutes. I'm just very, you know, respectful of time. So I want to share that in um, as we are looking at interacting with local media, uh, there's two kinds of accessibility questions that I, or two or three, but that I want to quickly focus on today. And one is giving them content in a way that they can use it. And that means knowing the time of day, knowing what windows they have, knowing what makes life use, what makes their lives easier and useful. Um, I don't know, someone is asking for the Google Doc link in the chat. If somebody could give them, uh, if, give Annalisa that, I'm not sure what that is, um, or Josh can. And the second is the, your approach and your messaging and your tone. Um, and I, I think that is, that's one of the deepest places where we've got um, opportunities to change and to, uh, I, I've always thought, write it so that the right wing neighbors that I grew up with loving, who I thought were totally wacko, write something in a way that they would say, oh, you got a point there, right? And so over the years, we've developed something we call polarity management. We've developed trainings for journalists. We've developed trainings for activists. Uh, the idea being, how can you authentically and honestly respect someone who's coming from what seemingly is a completely opposite view from yours? What is the underline? And it's a, it's a view taken from business um, that we found to be really helpful in, in our approach and helping us as journalists to think differently about the questions we ask and, um, and, how we, and how we look at storytelling so that we don't unconsciously promote divides and stir divisions, but instead do the opposite, which is what we, we have to find shared ground, but it has to be authentic. So that's polarity management. We could have a whole nother session on that, which I would love because it's, I love it. But um, that's why, you know, you might call our approach purple, right? In the Obama era, we would call it purple. Uh, progressive with a small P, small D, Democrat. Um, and let's see here, how are we doing, Anthony, for time? Is there anything else we need to go over? Oh, um, Josh, did you want to, you know, so yes, we have partnerships with, with uh, Kent State uh, University in Ohio, where we repackage their students' material. We've, we have a, a high school partnership with Quill and Scroll. And they're talking about, we're looking at raising money for a, a, a high school podcast that could be redistributed because a lot of these outlets, they need to get younger demographics. They could be interested in more youth, youth voices. Um, obviously we work with Apple Shop, with uh, the Daily Yonder and many of these, Iowa Watch, I don't know, Ohio, lots of local folks. We have various different uh, ways that we get our funding. Um, Josh, I don't know if we have any minutes left and or if you want to give a brief overview of all our revenue streams and where the bulk of it comes. Yeah, sure. So Josh, before you get into that, if we could, and we have really just maybe one or two minutes and then we'll transition to the Q&A, but maybe this relates to the uh, how you get your revenue, but what I'd really love to hear is how does a story emerge? Now, I know you all create some, but my understanding is you also let them bubble up from some of right. the nonprofit and other partners you have. So could you kind of link those two and briefly describe how a story surfaces, how a, how a group in, in Southern Virginia might generate a story that then would get the tremendous kind of reach that you have through PNS? Sure, yeah. So, you know, our, our um, PNS has always been, you know, primarily supported through memberships. Um, we have some grants, we have some partnerships with media outlets, um, but primarily it's, um, you know, nonprofits who what we call fun to beat, which, you know, 
Lark started PNS before philanthropy was supporting journalism at all. So this was kind of a small scale model of, you know, supporting coverage of an issue. Um, instead of, you know, uh, a big grant, it was, you know, a small amount for eight stories. Um, and uh, that's, how, that's, you know, we've had that model for 26 years and it's worked for us. And, you know, I think the, the difference maybe between PNS and other outlets is that we, re we really encourage the field to be feeding us stories. Um, you know, both our membership, but also the field at large. Um, and we think that that really improves our reporting because it makes us closer to the issues that are going on. And frankly, a lot of people who are out there doing advocacy and social change works do have a really good sense of the news. It's just so often they're buried in the program work that it's hard to come up for air and say, what does the public need to know? So PNS has been, you know, it's been an accountability mechanism. It's been a, um, a way to ensure that that work doesn't go uncovered. Um, and it's been a way for uh, stories to get covered that nobody else is paying attention to and to highlight you know, voices that have just been significantly underrepresented in the media. Um, and this, this you know, somewhat collaborative model with the sector is how we've, we've managed to make sure that works. Can you, um, can you give an example, Josh, of, of a story that emerged and how that happens? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So that story uh, you saw in Montana um, likely came to us uh, probably from one of the, the nonprofits in uh, Montana uh, who's supporting our work. They send the pitch to us and we say, well, is that news? Is that not news? So if we agree to do it, we'll do a deep dive with the source. We'll put the story together. We make sure it's accurate and then we send it out over the newswire. Um, and of course, you know, when we're collaborating, we're often asking them to be helping suggest sources for us to go talk to, um, you know, data points. Uh, if, um, you know, in a lot of the cases, uh, some of the pitches we get is like, there's a legislative hearing happening tomorrow. And in that case, you know, we're off doing the enterprise reporting to make sure that that story gets covered really well. Um, so it's, it really is a mix, but the, the, you know, the relationships that we've had with the field, I think is really, you know, I was a public news service member for uh, several years before I joined the staff and, you know, nobody talks about trade policy in rural areas. I mean, it's just not covered. So if public news service wasn't doing it, nobody would be doing it. Great. Well, I, I'm sure you all have much more to say, but we have about 15, 17 minutes left. So I'm going to open it up to um, questions from the group. And I'll start with the first one is Erica's question in the chat. Erica, why don't you just um, give voice to that real quick? Oh, sure. Yeah. I just like something that comes up all the time is, is the problem of, of both siding an issue, you know, liberal media particularly talks about this a lot and hates it and is very worried about it. So I'm wondering how you all handle that in your presentation of the news. Thanks, Erica. I'm smiling because I spend uh, I spend a lot of time training new our new our journalists on this and um, how we're not doing he said she said and leaving it to the audience to figure out who's lying. Um, we don't do false equivalencies. I go back to this approach of polarity management, um, and I'm not saying every story hits the mark, right? But that's what we aim to achieve. And the basis of that is, what is the underlying conflict? here that that is driving so many of our cultural chasms right and, and like it, how much responsibility is individual how much is collective looking at a story from that lens you come up with different questions and uh and it's a different story than who's right and who's wrong right um i, I could give an example quickly and, and anthony you have to stop me when our time's up but um idaho uh lumber mill leaves town the story is all about how environmentalists close down the forest and the lumber companies are eating that up. Okay, so I look a little deeper. I find out that the lumber company actually uh, left because of NAFTA and all the labor people who were laid off are um, eligible for NAFTA waivers. So it, it, taking it completely out of the, oh, it's obviously Enviro's, versus uh, you know, corporate interests and, and looking at it from a labor point of view, right? And so how much, I, I found that out partly because I went to the Economic Development Council of the town to look for solutions and what were they doing to help the people um, to get it out of this stuck place. Erica, I could go on, but, oh, I'm saying polarity. 
Annalisa, I'm saying polarity management. Um, and, uh, and, and again, come talk to me and I can share more about that afterwards. Erica, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's a good start. I, I, I definitely want to have a polarity management dedicated workshop sometime. <laughs> okay, we'd love to. Others. Um, Erica, I will say that we are under, you know, if we're going to tax anybody in a story, we're going to go to them for comment, right? And we're going to, we don't do spurious attacks. Uh, we, we, we try to stay out of gotcha journalism in general. Not that we don't criticize people, right? If, if that's what's happening in a community and that's what we're quoting. Lark and Josh, how do you deal with uh, like the information overload thing? I feel like one of the problems of progressives and the left is we're always trying to cram a ton of facts into everything that we say, whether we're talking to somebody at the door during a campaign or whether it's a press release or a news item, we're just like, boom, you know, it's all about the data. And or a 25 minute Zoom presentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So, so how do you, in packaging your stories, achieve a balance there, getting enough data to be you know, persuasive and telling the truth, but not overloading people. Is there, is there a certain philosophy about that or just you just take it as it comes? I, the quick answer is that um, we are blessed by the limitation of time. So mm -hmm. we're looking at a story that may be a minute 45. Um, and so in that story, we can't cram it full of facts. We, it has to be a story that orally makes sense. Right, so, so that means we have to leave a lot out and we can just do a little grab at a time. But it means that journalists have to be really good at understanding like the big picture and the deeper levels because it takes a lot of craft to be able to help people understand the significance of a little development in the big picture and tie it together to all the other little things that are going on. It's, it's, it's very hard. Um, but that's what we try and do. And in, in a short period, we're not cramming it full of crap. And the other thing is, we, you know, we started a nonprofit over time because I realized even if you give people a microphone, they might step into their negatives. They don't really often know how to use it in terms of their messaging. Um, and so on, the, on our nonprofit side over the years, we've encouraged people to come up with shared core messages for their state or their community or their sector. And, 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 and we are looking for ways, like for example, we came up with 20 years ago before Bush said it, we came up with misplaced priorities, right? And government has a role to play and things that need to be said in very contested areas. Um, okay, I'll stop. If, if I could just um, add real quick to that, you know, part of what I think makes PNS unique is that people don't actively seek it out, right? They they hear it throughout their day when they're listening to the radio, whether it's, you know, the talk radio or music or whatever. Um, and so in addition to the time limits, you know, people are only going to grab maybe a couple of little bites because that's how they're getting their information. But the fact that it's regular and people can hear one or two public news service stories a, a, a week means that we can tell some of these stories over longer periods of time and hopefully every time someone hears a story on climate change or democracy they're catching a little bit of you know a little bit of a different snippet and a new snippet each time i i always um think about it as jet you know water wears away stone and so you're gently gently continually talking about these issues and it takes sometimes years took us took five years to get minimum farm worker wage in idaho right it, it takes a long time when you do it gently, but it is effective. Thank you. Others? Yeah, Henry. Uh, oh, go ahead, Ellen. And, and I can't see all the hands, so please just- Oh, okay. Uh, all right. I'm now. brand new to public news service, so this is, this is great to know about. I had no idea. But anyway, I'm, I'm thinking about two possible uses for the stories um, that you present. Um, First of all, whether or not it's okay to share on social media, like with our OC Dems Facebook, for instance. So you're fine. We can pull any story we want. And will it? Do we need to do attribution, or do you want us to do any kind of attribution, or just? Uh, we I don't we know. love to have it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you're a media outlet or something, but I mean, if you're sharing a leak, the attribution is already in there. If you're okay, 
then absolutely, you know, according to or as reported by, yeah. Okay, and then the other um, thing we might want to steal is uh, content for letters to the editor. Um, your letters to the editor, I assume, come from individuals. So I would just, um, you could say, you know, take the information and, at, you know, and, and say, you know, I read in today's or here's, here's a story or whatever. Okay. But just, right. in other words, treat us the way that you would any other uh, media source. Sure. Okay. Thank you. And Lark, just to follow up, Lark and Josh. So Ellen is with the Orange County Dems in rural Virginia. And um, you, I'm guessing that you don't have local democratic committees as partners with PNS, but it's certainly possible that a nonprofit that's in Orange County or you know, a regional nonprofit that includes Orange County could be a partner. And then they could also surface stories particularly relevant to Orange County to present to you all for possible development into your stories, right? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, uh, we're always looking for really good story pitches. And of course it depends on, you know, the beat that they're funding. We would wanna make sure the stories were relevant to that. Um, but, uh, you know, everything we do gets distributed statewide, uh, though we do see some clustering in the pickup of uh, stories that are about an area, um, you know. I would say we've got, we built yet another platform, okay, when um, political money and government money started to approach us and we, we don't take those we're, for a public news service, doesn't take straight political or government funding. So we created another platform called Soundbite Services that could send a story to a city, to a market, to a county, to a congressional district, where it would be appropriate to take that kind of funding. So, hmm. um, but, but that takes a long conversation about the pickup. That's, it's, the pickup is absolutely different, okay? So, so um, uh, Ellen, we can talk about that on the side. I'm gonna put my email in there for everybody. Thanks, Lord. Just so you have it. So the soundbite services is more geared specifically for either political or uh, public sector. Oh, Chloe, are you okay? <laughs> Sorry, I'm fine. Sorry. <laughs> okay, no, just checking in. I was getting concerned. Um, we disclose all our funding and it helps us a lot that we are not taking government or political <laughs> But yes, Soundbite Services is a platform we can do anything else. And, and the funders can have a lot more input into those stories. We do not represent it as an you know, independent journalistic source. It's more, it can be advertorials. Uh, it can be much more of what we think of as political. And I would say, Ellen and everybody, you know, everything we do is political. So um, you, you know, we could talk about that, obviously. But there's a difference between uh, putting out stories every day featuring one candidate and or, um, you know, attacking another, that's not what we're doing on, on the public news service platform. I'm gonna keep asking questions, but other people, please jump in. Um, again, I might see your hand, but I might not. So don't hesitate to just grab the floor. Um, I, I have a question about once you get a relationship. So let's say you land a new media partner at some, um, small, mostly rural audience radio station in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, we'll say, and um, you start producing, you start getting stories from people in that area and producing them. But do you feel a certain kind of obligation to always have content for those partners? Do you try to make sure that PNS is producing relevant stories to every one of your partners on some kind of regular basis, or is it much more kind of as is appropriate the bottom line is money the bottom line is money so we take what we have and we stretch it as far as possible that's why we're doing statewide stories if the funding allowed we would drop it down and do city based stories right um but the, what the with the funding we have we make sure it's state based so that small outlet in shenandoah valley uh anthony that you're talking about we might not always have a story that is specifically useful to them. 
um, we're trying to include them by getting different voices from different parts of the state so that enough times there is something of use to them that they will keep looking at us and keep giving us a chance. So no, not every story is gonna be useful to every station. In a perfect world, it would, but, and frankly, I can see Josh getting ready. It's all money. We could be doing individual newscasts for everybody. Um, we could buy time on, think of this, all of their time is real estate. We are taking advantage of a real estate that they already have set up, which is their daily news holes, all right? They have to fill those. Other things, if you're talking about features, five to you know eight minutes, if you're talking about some regular rural report that could be done, great. That's gonna, you're gonna have to buy that. That that's that's I mean, it's amazing that we're getting away with a three-minute feature with uh, Daily Yonder, right? So hundreds of outlets are using that and we didn't even market it to them. We just told them, hey, we have a new product. I mean, that's that's phenomenal, you guys. It's very unusual, difficult to get, and particularly so easily. If we put a lot of money into marketing, we could get a lot more. But um, does that help answer at all, Anthony? Yeah, I guess my question, you used the analogy of water slowly wearing away the rock. So my, my question was not so much whether it was oh. always relevant to that station, but once you start providing content for that station, you add that station, then you're trying to provide content to them all the time. Absolutely. Regularly. The, the, yes. the media outlets get pissed, you know, it, once, they, once they're used to relying on us, like, oh, I come in at 4 a.m. and at least I'll have something from these guys to start my day, right? Um, it helps them a lot and, and they don't like it when we go dark. So for example, we're looking to start right now in Georgia. We're not gonna start until we have enough funding raised in Alabama. Um, we, we can't do it until we know we have enough money to do something regularly enough that um, that they will pay attention to us, and then and long enough that they won't get mad when or if we go away. Erica, um, yeah. So, could you say more about like why it is that you think PNS might be able to reach like a conservative or a swing voter in a way that like an NPR or Pacifica affiliate wouldn't be able to? Uh, yes. So in terms of Pacifica, I would say, and I love Pacifica, we're collaborators, but they are serving a certain sector of the progressive market. Most conservative types would never be listening to their content and their content, yeah, wouldn't happen. With NPR, that is, they have a more diverse audience, right? At the last time I checked, it was a third left, a third right, and a third independent. That was the last time I checked. I don't know, could have been a couple of years ago. But, but, um, and also last I checked, and, and Josh was challenging me on this, but last I checked, they were getting 17% of the radio listening market. And again, that's very small. So I love public radio, but I'm not typical. So there's a whole world of people that are not listening to Pacifica or NPR, and um, they care about pocketbook issues, money, food, jobs. Um, and so we're, we're, we're looking to, and they don't wanna hear a, like overly, you know, overly emotional anybody, even though that's life and we have to have emotion to make people feel and, to re and for them to remember things, but not overly. Um, and so if you have sort of this, I don't wanna criticize us as Josh stopped me, I'm about to, you know, be self-critical. Uh, uh, I can, I can st step in and add a little bit to what you were saying, if you'd like. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, uh, it really is about reaching people where they're at, right? Um, you know, uh, public news service is not something people tune into, right? We're a newswire. So they're tuning into national native news, or they're tuning into KKOH, which is a conservative talk station in Reno, um, or they're turning into WNAX, which is where Lawrence Welk got his start. Um, uh, and, you know, and so they're hearing the public news service story throughout the course of their day. Um, and so, you know, in terms of moving people, you know, that's maybe a different conversation. I, again, it's about water wearing away the stone, you know, it's that little bit over time. Um, but as far, you know, but the first step of that is to actually be in the places where the people who you want to reach are. Um, and um, 
you know, the, the internet is becoming increasingly harder to do that. And, uh, you know, I guess I would say radio is, is a little bit different and, um, you know, maybe local TV, but that's also really expensive. Um, so we've, you know, um, we're just doing our best to, to be in all the places that people are. So we, I mean, we have been doing more online. We've, you know, we're on smart speakers, we're on all that. So if you want to seek out public news service content, you absolutely can get it. Um, but it's that it's that passive consumption that's really allowed us to build up this network over time. And I would add, I would add on to Josh, you've made you're making me think, Erica, that it's it's a lot of what we do is NPR kind mm -hmm. of content, but it's packaged in a more commercial way. So a lot is the packaging and the accessibility in terms of making it easier for people to use it. And and you know that I showed you the screen of our back end where media outlets go to download content. They can take individual sound bites. They can take the picture or video if we have it. They can take the print. They can take the script. On the bottom of the script is all the information they can go after and get their own for talk shows they, they can get. And we know this has happens because members tell us. Um, so we make it super easy for, we have a short wrap, you know, that's one sound bite. We have a full wrap that's under two minutes. We, we, if they ask us to do a sign off for their station, we will to make it look like they actually have more staff than they have. So the, the point is we're, um, we're, we're not uh, trying to promote our brand. And that makes a huge difference in making things easy. And that's hard for most other media outlets to do. They can't afford to not promote their brand. And you're, you're not trying to broaden the choir exactly in the way that most of us are constantly trying to expand the number of people who listen to us you're going to other choirs and giving them tunes that they can that they can play. I mean, it seems like a brilliant strategy because I can't can't even begin to say how many times I and others have said, "What a great story I just heard on NPR!" Or, what a fabulous piece in whatever. And then the next thing is, but none of our conservative friends would ever listen to that. But you're you're going to their sites and embedding these bread and butter stories. To me, that's just a remarkable kind of breakthrough. Um, I'm gonna move us now, and we are at 420 and we are gonna wrap up, but we have begun as of last month to do an after chat. Now, this is a, a surprise for Josh and Lark. I don't know if you can stay, if you cannot, totally understood. If you can, that would be great. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna wrap up this um, session now and for anyone who would like to stay on, um, we will continue the conversation for roughly 15 more minutes, 15 to, to 20 more minutes, depending on people's energy and conversation. Again, if, if Lark and or Josh can join us for that after chat, wonderful. Um, if you're not able to, we'll just continue the conversation with anyone who wants to go into that. So uh, thank you both for a terrific, terrific presentation, good conversation and uh, remind everybody that we will be here uh, same time and place, first Wednesday of the month, 3.30 next month. Erica, you probably know it off the top of your head. Can you remind us who our um, leader of the conversation will be uh, in April? April is uh, Richard Martin, who wrote a report called Factory Towns about the impact of deindustrialization in the Midwest swing states on voter behavior. Cool. Really good stuff. Yeah, excellent. Again, thank you. So at this point, we're not gonna leave this Zoom and go to another. It's simply a matter of if you can and want to stay on, do so. We'll give everybody about 30 seconds to make that decision and then we'll enter our after chat.